It was as follows. Six, in view of the questions raised for determination in the substantive originating notice of motion, the full court of five justices will be sitting tomorrow. In paragraph 11 above, I have already explained the necessity for such an order. Indeed, at that next hearing on Friday, 2nd March 2018, the full bench of five justices did sit. Objection was taken to the presence of two of the justices on the full panel. Those justices recused themselves. Other justices of the Supreme Court replaced them at the hearing the following Tuesday, 6th March 2018, after Mr. Justice Chan, then Chief Justice, had reconstituted the panel the previous Monday, 5th March 2018. That being the case, it was quite obvious that a decision could not be given by the court within 30 days of 5th February 2018, as stipulated in Section 47, Subsection 3 of the Public Elections Act 2012. And again, Mr. Justice Edwards, Chief Justice, has with the unanimous concurrence of the other justices in the case cited above, Dr. Sylvia Blyden and others against His Excellency President Julius Madabio and others, ruled that the Constitution takes precedence as it should over any other enactment. In this respect also, Section 47, Subsection 3 of the Public, Order, the Public Elections Act 2012, clearly inconsistent with the provisions of Section 126 of the Constitution. Having dealt in some measure with the provisions in the Public Elections Act 2012, which deal with the manner in which the challenge to the nomination of a candidate for a presidential election ought to be carried out, and consequently pointing out where those provisions are inconsistent with those in the 1991 Constitution, I shall go on to deal with the corollary and perhaps the principal issue brought up by the plaintiff, which is whether, being a citizen of another country, while maintaining one's citizenship of Sierra Leone, deprives one of the rights to contest election in Sierra Leone for the presidency. This issue calls for the interpretation of Section 76, Subsection 1, Subsection A of the 1991 Constitution. During the course of the hearing, the plaintiff discontinued the entire action against all defendants. This was done after all parties had filed or had been given leave to file out of time their respective statements of case. In these circumstances, counsel for the, the seventh defendant requested that this court make a pronouncement on one of the reliefs it had sought so that there might be clarity on the issue as to when a Sierra Leone loses his citizenship and consequently his eligibility to contest presidential and parliamentary elections. The court agreed that it would do so and I shall do so in the course of this judgment. But first, it is necessary to set out the origins of the action and the cause it took in this court, as this procedure would have some bearings on the issue of costs at the end of the day. The plaintiff, David Fauna, as stated above on 5th February 2018, filed in this court's registry an originating notice. of motion posing certain questions which, according to his solicitors and counsel, needed to be answered by the court, and if they were answered in a certain manner, several declarations were sought. The action was initially brought against alleged Dr. Kande Kole Yunkela, the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, the Chief Electoral Commissioner Mohamed Infa Ali Conte, and the National Electoral Commission. Later in the proceedings, as indicated above, on the application of counsel for the first defendant, Dr. Yunkela, Dr. Yunkela, and by order of the court, the other three defendants were added on, namely Dr. Dennis Bright, Chairman, National Group, Francis Indoor, Secretary General, National Gun Coalition, and the National Gun Coalition Party itself. The plaintiff asked this court firstly to interpret sections 41, 75, and 76 of the 1991 Constitution of Sierra Leone. Interpretation of those constitutional provisions will help determine it, one, whether a naturalized citizen of Sierra Leone is disqualified being elected as a member of parliament and thereby also disqualified to be elected president. Two, whether a citizen of a country other than Sierra Leone, having become one voluntarily or otherwise, in brackets, or is under a declaration of allegiance to such a country, is disqualified from being elected a member of the Sierra Leone parliament and consequently disqualified to be elected president. Three, if the answer to question one is in the affirmative, what is the effect in law of a naturalized citizen running for election as a member of parliament and consequently for the office of president? Four, if the answer to question two is in the affirmative, what is the effect of such a citizen running for parliament and also for the office of president? 
Secondly, the, the plaintiff posed for determination by this court the interpretation of sections 5 and 7 of the Sierra Leone Citizenship Act 1973 as amended by Act No. 11 of 2006. First question posed was whether upon a proper constru construction of sections 10 of the section 10 of the 1973 Act as amended and before the coming into force of the Amendment Act in 2006, a person having citizenship, having certain citizenship and any other citizenship citizenship as one at the same time by operation of law ceased to be a Sierra Leonean. Two, whether upon a proper interpretation of section 11 of the 1973 Act as amended and before the coming into effect of the 2006 Amendment Act, a person upon attaining the age of 22 years being a citizen of Sierra Leone and also a citizen of another country by operation of the law ceased to be a citizen of Sierra Leone. Three, if the answer to question one the answer to question one is in the affirmative can such a person be eligible to contest parliamentary and presidential elections if the answer to two is in the affirmative what is the effect in law of a person who already who is already a citizen of Sierra Leone and also a citizen of another country can such a person be eligible to contest parliamentary and presidential elections the plaintiff sought the following declarations one that by virtue of sections 41, 75, and 76 of our 91 Constitution, no person shall be qualified to be elected a member of parliament or president. He is a naturalized citizen of Sierra Leone. Two, that by virtue of sections 41, 75, and 76 of our Constitution, no person shall be so qualified to be elected a member of parliament or president if he is a citizen of a country other than Sierra Leone, having become such a citizen voluntarily or is a declaration of allegiance to the other country. Three, that by virtue of sections 10 and 11 of the 1973 Act as amended and before the coming into force of the 2006 Amendment Act, a citizen of Sierra Leone, who was also a citizen of another country, ceased to be a Sierra Leonean. And four, that if the declaration sought above are granted, the first defendant of the is disqualified to be elected a member of parliament or president. The motion was supported by the affidavit of the plaintiff himself deposed to so on to also on 5th February 2018. Since the plaintiff withdrew the action, or was given leave to withdraw the action, rather, I shall not dwell on all the matters deposed to therein. I shall only set out and comment on those which may assist this court in making the declaration sought impliedly by the first defendant and expressly by the seventh defendant. The plaintiff deposed that he was a businessman and also a registered voter. He did not declare his citizenship whether by birth or by naturalization. In this respect, his action would have failed in any event because Section 47, Subsection 2 of the Public Elections Act 2012 stipulates that the person taking objection to the nomination of a presidential candidate should himself be a citizen of Sierra Leone. He exhibited his voter identification card, which does not necessarily and by itself prove that he is a citizen of Sierra Leone. He goes on to depose to certain matters of legal, which he says are based on what he was told by his lawyers. One such was that prior to the 2006 Amendment Act, Sierra Leone did not recognize dual citizenship and that by virtue of the unamended 1973 Citizenship Act, any person who had attended the age of 22 years ceased automatically to remain a Sierra Leone citizen if he held the citizenship of another country. Another matter I deposed to is that certain persons may have ceased to be Sierra Leone citizens by becoming citizens of another country and that these persons were not eligible to be elected members of parliament. He admits that he is that the first defendant was born in Sierra Leone and that the first defendant has been in possession of the country's passport over the years. He goes on to depose that he was informed and that the first defendant had himself admitted that he had become a naturalized citizen of the United States of America and had been issued with a United States of America passport. He was aware that the defendant was a flag bearer for the National Grown Coalition and also a parliamentary candidate for the same party. He said in his paragraph 16 that it is public knowledge that the first defendant had said at a press conference that he had renounced his United States citizenship so as to comply with the 1991 Constitution. He deposes further that he was informed by one Abu Bakar Sanko, whom he verily believes that he 
Joseph Sankor are taking objection to the candidacy of first defendants in the Cambia constituency 62 for the parliamentary election on the ground that first defendants held dual nationality, or that Sankor's objection had been ignored by the returning officer in Cambia. To further his inquiries about the first defendant status, he wrote to the Minister of Internal Affairs asking whether first defendant had resumed his Sierra Leonean nationality. He was informed by the ministry that it had no record of first defendant resuming his nationality. He was not satisfied that first defendant had truly renounced his American citizenship. First defendant had not provided any proof of his renunciation of American citizenship, nor of his resumption of Sierra Leone citizenship. In his paragraph 24, he deposes that, to, that I honestly believe the only reason why the first defendant has not produced his certificate of loss of nationality is because it does not in fact exist and therefore his claim of renunciation of U.S. nationality is incorrect. I have quoted this particular paragraph verbatim as it has some bearing on the point in time when the plaintiff realized that in truth, first defendant renounces U.S. citizenship. This also has a bearing on the issue of costs not signing plaintiff's withdrawal, um, being granted leave to withdraw his action subsequently. These facts, deposed to by the plaintiff, formed the basis for instituting the action hearing. On 12 February 2018, the plaintiff swore and deposed a further affidavit. To that affidavit, it has DF5, a copy of the letter he had received from the Ministry of Internal Affairs. That letter reads, quote the letter, I refer to your letter dated 19th January 2018 on the above subject matter. We have conducted a search of our records and can confirm that Alaji Dr. Kande Yunkela has not availed himself, as put by you, to, I think this should be off, the provisions of the Salon Citizenship Act, Salon Citizenship Amendment Act No. 11 of 2006 to resume Salon Citizenship. Furthermore, our record do not show, I'm quoting the letter, do not show any compliance with the conditions precedent as contained in the Sierra Leone Citizenship Amendment Act No. 13 of 1976 or any other provision, legal or otherwise, in this regard." End of quote. In that letter, the minister did not explain why he had concluded that first, the first defendant had lost Sierra Leone citizenship and why he, the first defendant, needed to resume the same. In any event, it is the view of the the minister may have acted outside the law. No application was made to him on the Access of Information Act 2012. He, as a public officer, though not in the public service, in terms of Section 170, subsections 1 and 4 of the 1991 Constitution, was therefore bound by the oath of secrecy attached to the public office he held. He may have come close to contravening the provisions contained in Section 7, subsection 1 of the Treason and State Offenses Act 1963. Section 7, subsection 1 states, inter alia, if any person having in his possession or control any document or information which has, been entrust, which has been entrusted in confidence to him by any person holding an office established by the Constitution, or a public office of which he has obtained or to which he has had access owing to his position as a person who holds or has held any such office as aforesaid, or as a person who holds or has held a contract made on behalf of government, or as a person who holds or has held any such office or contract, A, communicates the document or information to any person other than a person to whom he is authorized to communicate it, or a person to whom it is in the interest of the state's duty to communicate it, shall be guilty of an offense. The minister had no right to disclose the information of a private nature to any individual requesting him to do so in a personal and private capacity. The plaintiff has repeatedly stressed his independence from any political leanings. He has not said he was a public officer, nor anyone to whom it was necessary to communicate official information for official purposes. He had no right to the information he requested. The minister also had no right to respond to his information, to his request for information. If he had or has that right, then a person in his position or in an equivalent position is equally entitled to disclose information of a confidential nature to anyone who requests him to disclose the same. In his letter to the minister, the plaintiff did not state that he was requesting the information for official purposes. Disclosing official information for private purposes has serious consequences. As such, the minister was not obliged to disclose the same to him. I shall return to this issue later in this judgment. Further, to show how wrong the means, he certainly did not advert his mind to the Passport Act 1964, Act Number 49 of 1964, as amended by Section 7 of the Interpretation Act 
1970, Interpretation Act 1971, and by the Passports Amendment Act 1974, the latter adding on a new Section 8. Section 2 of the 1964 Act states, subse Section 2, Subsection 1, the President, acting in accordance with the advice of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, sorry, formerly Minister of External Affairs, may issue a passport in the existing form or such other form as he may prescribe by notice in the Gazette to any person who is a citizen of Sierra Leone. Subsection 2, where any person has either A, renounced his citizenship, or B, been deprived of his citizenship other than by order made under the provisions of the Sierra Leone Nationality and Citizenship Act 1962, since repealed by Section 28 of the 1973 Citizenship Act, his passport shall be withdrawn from him. The plaintiff did not suggest or contend at any point in time that seventh defendant's first defendant, I beg your pardon, first defendant's passport had been withdrawn from him. No, neither did the minister in his letter to the plaintiff assert the same. On the contrary, the evidence available in the affidavit and statement of case of the first defendant shows shows that his passport has been renewed successively since 1980. Section 28 of the 1973 Citizenship Act also amended the relevant provisions in Section 1 of the Nations in brackets Registration, Immigration and Expulsion Act 1965, Section 1 of the Non-Citizens Trade and Business Act 1969, and Section 4 of the Interpretation Act 1971, where the definition of native for the purposes of the Act is given. Further, the definition of native in the 1971 Act has been furthered by Section 3 of the 1976 Citizenship Act. The plaintiff deposed further to the state of the law in the United States relating to the nationalization process and what it entails, principally the renunciation of the nationality originally possessed by the applicant for naturalization. This rationalization is made notwithstanding that in his first affidavit he had deposed that he knew the first defendant was Berlin, which automatically made him a Serenian citizen by birth, a Serenian by birth. What he did not depose to was the state of the law in Sierra Leone relating to what renunciation of citizenship really means for a citizen by birth. The fact that the first defendants did not appear on any list prepared by the United States of America Department responsible for naturalization matters, for, the, for naturalization matters, has no bearing on the state of the law in Sierra Leone. Further, there is a principle in, in international law and expressing our citizenship laws that a person should not be rendered stateless inten, intentionally. This is a matter I shall return to later. On 15 February 2018, the plaintiff filed a statement of case in accordance with the rules of this court. In view of the plaintiff's subsequent request to withdraw his case, and in view of the seventh defendant's application that this court should make two of the declarations set out in his statement of case, only two submissions in the plaintiff's statement of case merit attention. At page 9, paragraph C, subparagraph 2, subparagraph B, the plaintiff submits as follows. To quote the plaintiff, we will submit that this case of the, 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 the authority, that is Hashi, against the Secretary of State for the Home Department, 2016 England and Wales Court of Appeal reports, page 1136, reiterates the point that citizenship how, how one becomes a citizen and one loses his, his, his citizenship as an alien is a matter of law with regards to the law of citizenship in this case in Sierra Leone and not with reference to any other document, not even holding a passport. He continues further in subparagraph 2, subparagraph C, as follows. We will submit on the basis of the submissions above, the first defendant can only be deemed a citizen or non-citizen or be deemed to have lost his citizenship or be deemed to now be a Sierra Leonean in accordance with what the citizenship laws of Sierra Leone expressly prescribe and not with reference to any other fact. These two subparagraphs succinctly set out what the plaintiff's complaint is all about. It is our view, and as I have stated in the opening paragraphs above, that our Sierra Leone Citizenship Act 1973, as amended in 1976, 2006, and finally in 2017, by Act Number 3 of 2017, sets out the position clearly and requires no interpretation. It stipulates how one loses one's citizenship and how one regains it. The minister's letter exhibited by the plaintiff to his second affidavit was inaccurate in the conclusion reached therein. It was clearly tendentious and made without proper consideration of the law in question. It follows that contrary to the submission made by the plaintiff in subparagraph 2, subparagraph Q, at the same page 9 of his statement of case, 
it was not the duty of the third and fourth defendants to open an inquiry as to the current status of the first defendant once he had provided the appropriate test required in the schedule to the Public Elections Act 2012. Making a false statement in the declaration for nomination is punishable as perjury. Making a false statement in the declaration for nomination is punishable as perjury. That would have been a matter for a person taking objection to first defendant's nomination as a candidate. Further, plaintiff has not, in all of the documents filed on his behalf, himself provided proof of his citizenship. He has merely exhibited his voter identification card. That is not, by and in itself, proof of citizenship. It follows also that the conclusions reached by the plaintiff at subparagraph 3, subparagraphs A and B on pages 9 and 10 of his Making a false statement in the declaration for nomination is punishable as perjury. That would have been a matter for a person taking objection to first defendant's nomination as a candidate. Further, plaintiff has not, in all of the documents filed on his behalf, himself provided proof of his citizenship. He has merely exhibited his voter identification card. That is not, by and in itself, proof of citizenship. It follows also that the conclusions reached by the plaintiff at subparagraph 3, subparagraphs A and B on pages 9 and 10 of his statement of case are insupportable as of January 2018. The state of the law as to citizenship in January 2018 was as he stated in the 1973 Act as amended in 1976, in 2006 and 2017 respectively. In his conclusions which the plaintiff conflated the meaning of citizen to be a citizen and the renunciation of citizenship as one and the same thing. Season to be a citizen is a passive act. You may have ceased to be one because of something you may have done or not done. But renouncing one's citizenship requires something to be done both by both the person concerned and some other authority connected with the act of renunciation. If the further arguments advanced by the plaintiff in his subparagraph three, subparagraph E and F, subparagraphs E and F are taken to their logical conclusion, it would mean that the first having ceased to be a Sierra citizen for this and for all time by taking on American citizenship would automatically become stateless once he relinquished or renounced his American citizenship. There is provision in our laws to prevent such an unfortunate consequence. In their haste, both the plaintiff and the Minister of Internal Affairs at the time omitted to advert their respective minds to this provision. In any event, and in order to provide clarity, one cannot in the nature of things cease to be a citizen by birth under Sierra law. This has been clarified by the 2017 amendment to the 1973 Act. One cannot properly deny the circumstances amendment to the 1973 Act. One cannot properly deny the circumstances of his birth. One can, however, renounce an adopted nationality or citizenship a citizenship conferred by either naturalization or registration or one transmitted to that person by one or both of his parents. The Australian case to which reference will be made below illustrates why under Australian law an Australian citizen could still be considered ineligible for election to that parliament because of the transmission to that person of foreign nationality through one or both of his parents. On 1st March 2018, the, defendant, the first defendant filed a statement of case. In this pleading, the first defendant sets out in detail the reasons why the plaintiff's action should fail. First, he avers that he is a citizen by birth and by descent of Sierra Leone. He admits that he had, in 1995, acquired citizenship of the United States of America by naturalization. He effectively renounced that citizenship, that citizenship in November 2017, well before the nomination process for the 2018 elections began, in January 2018. He had held a press conference to announce his renunciation to the whole world. As such, the fact of his renunciation of American citizenship was a matter well known or must have been well known to plaintiff. The plaintiff had earlier in his affidavit admitted that he was aware of the press conference and what transpired at that event. The main contention in the first defendant statement of case is that the proceedings were unnecessary. There was a laid-down procedure for persons wanting to challenge the candidacy of an individual who wished to contest either election. That procedure could be found in the Public Elections Act 2012. As such, the plaintiff's action amounted to an abuse of the jurisdiction of the court. 
I have dealt with this aspect of the case above, and that in view of this court's decision in the Dr. Silver Biden and others case, the plaintiff could only have come to this court by way of an originating notice of motion. On 19th March 2018, first defendant deposed and swore to his affidavit in opposition to the plaintiff's motion. This was done with leave of the court. There is no express provision in the Supreme Court Rules 1982, Statute Instrument of 1982, for the filing of an affidavit in opposition by a defendant. Rule 92, sub Rule 2, paragraph A, speaks of an affidavit verifying the facts, the, verifying the facts, particulars, documentary, or otherwise contained in the defendant's statement of case. But in order, sorry, but in order to aid our deliberations, we allowed the first defendant to do this. In his affidavit, first defendant narrated his ancestry, then how he became a citizen of the United States of America and how he announced the citizenship of that country before being nominated as a parliamentary candidate and as a candidate in the presidential election in 2018. He exhibited to that affidavit copies of his birth certificate, his current Sierra Leone passport, his voter identification card, his certificate of loss of American nationality together with his oath slash affirmation of renunciation of American nationality and his nomination certificates for the parliamentary and presidential elections respectively. Exhibited also are copies of the decisions taken by the Cambia District Returning Officer and by the fourth defendant on objections raised to his candidature in both elections. The last, the last exhibit is a copy of a document issued by the United States of America government setting out the steps to be taken in renouncing American nationality. The second defendant, though represented at the hearings by state council, did not file a statement of case. The third and fourth defendants filed a joint statement of case through their solicitors on 27th February 2018. A solicitor in the firm, Mr. Dusil Taylor, on the same day deposed and swore to an affidavit verifying his client's joint statement of case. Several documents are attached to that statement of case, including Sierra Leone Gazette No. 12, published on Tuesday, 30th January 2018, setting out the names of parties and of their respective candidates for the expected presidential election on 27th March 2018. The statement of case filed by these defendants, defendants contains that the proper procedure for registering candidates for the presidential election was followed to the letter, and that the plaintiff has not adopted the proper procedure to contest the first defendant's eligibility to contest that election. As they did not seek any declaration from this court, I need not dwell further on the other issues raised in their joint statement of case, save to say that at the hearing on 9th March 2018, sorry, 2018, Mr. Taylor, counsel for both third and fourth defendants, stated that the reason they had contested the plaintiff's claim was because in paragraph 10 of the plaintiff's statement of case, the plaintiff had alleged that the third and first fourth defendants had been, in, been incompetent in the way they had handled the plaintiff's objection to the first defendant's nomination as a presidential and as a parliamentary candidate. Clearly, as the plaintiff has withdrawn the case, has been given leave to withdraw the case against all defendants, the result is that the allegation is unfounded and remains unproven. In any event, as will be shown later in this judgment, the third and fourth defendants were quite right in the way the objections to the first defendant's candidature were dealt with. On 1st March 2018, pursuant to an order made by this court, leave was given to the 5th, 6th, and 7th to file respective statements of case out of time. This was done pursuant to powers on this court, on this court by Rule 89 Sub Rule 5 of the Supreme Court Rules 1982. They were to be filed against 2 p.m. the following day, that is Friday, 2nd March 2018. The statement of case was on the 2nd of March 2018 filed on behalf of both 5th and 7th defendants. The 6th defendant did not file any. On the 2nd of March 2018, counsel for the 6th defendant, Mr. Suleiman Banjo Tijansi, the 2nd, applied for the recusal of Justices Solomon and Matthew Jones, respectively. Both justices recused themselves the following Monday, that is 5th March 2018. The Honorable Chief Justice was requested to replace both justices. The court was reconstituted the following day, Tuesday, 6th March 2018, with Justices Alusain Sisi and Senghor Koroma joining the panel of justices. A further extension of time was given for the sixth defendant to file a statement of case against 19th March 2018, and for any other defendant to file an amended statement of case against that date. Likewise, the plaintiff was given leave to file a reply, if necessary, against 21st March 2018, then adjourned to 28th March 2018. 
I must state for the record, and as explained above, that the court was forced to depart from the strict rules of filing because of the exigencies of the situation. The presidential election and also the parliamentary, city, and local council council selections, respectively, were due to be held and were held on Tuesday, 7th March 2018, the day after the court hearing. No candidate was able to gain 55% term of the votes cast, and a runoff as required by law was fixed for Tuesday, 27th March 2018. The interlocutory orders granted by this court will not therefore necessarily be granted in future cases in the absence of such exigencies. Further, another challenge to the holding of the runoff election had to be had by this court the, um, in the presence of um, uh, myself, Justice Robert Thompson, Justice Supreme Court. That is Supreme Court case miscellaneous application 1 of 2018, National Electoral Commission and another against Ibrahim Sui Kuruma. Judgment was delivered two days ago on 1st September 2021. But for the swift action taken by this court in that case, the holding of the runoff was frustrated by just a single individual. Pursuant to leave granted as stated above, the seventh defendant on 19th March 2018 filed its statement of case dated 16th March 2018. The seventh defendant is the political party the first defendant belongs to and under whose banner he contested the presidential election held on 7th March 2018. It reprises the case filed by the first defendant, and there is no need to set it out here. It has been mentioned specifically because the seventh defendant's counsel, Ms. Jusu Sharif, has applied, as she was entitled to do, for a declaration to be made by this court in terms of paragraph 4 of that statement of case. It reads, paragraph 4, the seventh defendant submits that the question of the meaning and effect of sections 10 and 11 of the Sierra Leone Citizenship Act 1973 has amended although of no direct relevance and interest to the first defendant in this particular case, and even though now repealed, is indeed of great moment and concern to the seventh defendant, which is a political party with obligations to promote and protect the rights and interests of its membership, whether in and out of Sierra Leone, and to the entire nation. The seventh defendant thus invites this honorable court not only to refuse to make the declaration each sought in the, sought in the plaintiff's originating notice of motion dated 5th February 2018, but to rather declare that, to quote Ms. Jusu Sharif, any person who upon attaining the age of 22 years was or is a citizen of Sierra Leone and also a citizen of another country and did, did and does not by operation of law or any other means cease to be a Sierra Leonean. In this respect, the declaration sought by the seventh defendant is related not only to the provisions of the citizenship laws, also to the interpretation to be given to section 76, subsection 1, paragraph A of the 1991 Constitution. Specifically, that portion which reads as follows, to quote the provision, or is a citizen of a country other than Sierra Leone, having become such a citizen voluntarily, or is under a declaration of allegiance to such a country. The first defendant is clearly a citizen of Sierra Leone by birth, as the documents exhibited to his affidavit and to his statement of case clearly show. It is not therefore necessary to embark on an excursus into the eligibility to contest presidential elections of one who is a citizen by naturalization. Section 124, subsection 1, section 1 of the Constitution states, The Supreme Court shall save as otherwise provided in section 122 of this Constitution have original, original jurisdiction to the exclusion of all other courts, a, in all matters relating to the enforcement or interpretation of any provision of this Constitution. Section 122, subsection 1, confers appellate jurisdiction on this court and does not concern us here. However, section 122, subsection 3 does. It states, for the purposes of hearing and determining any matter within its jurisdiction and the amendment, execution, or the enforcement of any judgment or order made or any such matter, on any such matter, and for the purposes of any other authority expressly or by, necessarily, by necessary implication given to it, the Supreme Court shall have all the powers, authority, and jurisdiction vested in any court established by this Constitution or any other law. As indicated in paragraph 40 above, section 124, subsection 1, should be read subject to section 122, sub 3. The general original jurisdiction is conferred in section 124, subsection 1, but that constitutional provision to further to stipulate how the jurisdiction could be exercised. There was no need for that, as that had already been done in section 122, subsection 3. Further, section 145 of the Constitution established the Rules of Court Committee and sets out its purpose. Section, subsection 145, 1 of established the committee 
and subsection 145 subsection 2 sets out sets out its duties as follows subject to the provisions of this section, the rules of court committee may make rules of court for regulating the practice and procedure of all courts in Sierra Leone which shall include rules relating to the prevention of frivolous and vexatious proceedings the rules governing practice and procedure in this court are the Supreme Court rules 1982 made pursuant to the now repealed 1978 Constitution of Sierra Leone by reason of the transitional provisions contained in section, subsection 175 of the 1991 Constitution, these rules still apply in this court. Rule 89 is the principal rule and sets out the manner in which the original jurisdiction should be invoked. It should be by originating notice of motion supported by an affidavit setting out among the relief sought. The plaintiff's statement of case could be filed in the, at the same time as the motion, but in any event, not less than 10 days after the filing of the motion. Rule 92 states that if the defendant upon whom the motion has been served wishes to contest the case, he too must file a statement of case within 10 days or such for the time as the court may allow. The statement of case shall contain inter alia the facts and particulars verified by affidavit which the defendant seeks to rely on. The parties may agree or the court may order them to file a memorandum of issues of agreed issues. Rule 97 sub rule 1 is relevant to the request made by counsel for the seventh defendant for a declaration to be made in seventh defendant's favor. It states, rule 97 sub, sub rule 1, the court may, after considering the statement of the plaintiff's case and of the defendant's case, the memorandum of agreed issues and any arguments of law, decide to determine the action and give judgment in court on a fixed date without argument or may appoint a time at which the parties shall appear before the court before the hearing of the action. It is the view of this court that notwithstanding the application for withdrawal of the plaintiff's case at the stage where arguments were due to commence, this court has jurisdiction to determine the action brought by the plaintiff in terms of the declaration sought by the seventh defendant in his statement of case. It is, as it were, the seventh defendant's counterclaim. Rule 98 states, where no provision is expressly made in these rules relating to the original and the supervisory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, the practice and procedure for the time being of the High Court shall apply mutantis, mutantis, mutandis. Other than the general pronouncement in Rule 7, Sub Rule 1, set out in paragraph 44 above, there is no specific rule in the Supreme Court rules dealing with the situation where the plaintiff applies for withdrawal from the litigation after filing a, state of, a statement of case, but where a defendant at the same time seeks judgment in terms of his statement of case. This court had to invoke Order 24 of the High Court Rule 2007 in order to permit the plaintiff to withdraw his claim. That rule states as follows. Rule 24, Sub Rule 3, Paragraph 1. Ex provided by Rule 2, a party may not discontinue an action, whether by writ or other or counterclaim, or withdraw any particular claim made by him in the action or counterclaim without the leave of the court. And the court, hearing an application for the grant of such leave, may order the action or counterclaim to be discontinued or any particular claim made in it to be struck out as against any or all of the parties against whom it is brought on such terms as to cost the bringing of an action or otherwise as it thinks just. The seventh defendant has applied for its claim decided by this court, and this court thus has the jurisdiction. The case of Supreme Court case number 1 slash 2002, Daniel Sanko against the president, President Ameti Jankaba, shows that this can be done. There, the plaintiff filed his originating notice of motion and did nothing further. The defendant had filed a statement of case in the plaintiff's claim in the motion. The court held that it had jurisdiction to hear and determine the case on the basis of regular similar terms. One of the cases in which the issue of what should happen when a party to the litigation in the Supreme Court withdraws or abandons its case, its statement of case, is the Supreme Court Criminal Appeal Number 11 of 2014, Joseph Paul State, which by Mr. Justice Jalo, Chief Justice, myself, Mr. C.S. Jalo, Mr. Justice C., and Mr. Jalai, Justices of the Supreme Court, judgment delivered on 23rd November 2017 by myself. There I said at page 5 of 34, page 25 of the judgment of the court, I shall end by recording for posterity that when the appeal came up for hearing during the May-June sittings, Mrs. Gramer, uh, sorry, Ms. Gramer, appeared for the appellant and Mr. Abu Bakr appeared as counsel for the respondent. Ms. Drame relied on the statement of case filed by the appellant's original counsel, Mr. Achigwe. 
Mr. Abubakar sought leave and was granted leave by this court on 5th June 2017 to file the respondent's statement of case out of time. But when the appeal came up for hearing the following day, that is on 6th June 2017, Mr. Abubakar surprisingly informed the court that he wished to withdraw the respondent's statement of case. The court granted him leave to do so. On reading through the statement of case, it was considerable thought and research had been put into it, but the court could not but accede to Mr. Abubakar's application. Thereupon, Ms. Drame asked that the appellant's convictions be quashed. This court took the view, and rightly so, that the withdrawal of the respondent's statement of case did not amount to a command to this court that he or she no longer wishes to defend the judgment of the court below or to go on with prosecuting his or her case. When the original jurisdiction of this court is invoked, this court will have to decide it's once it has become seized of it. The earlier case referred to in that judgment was Civil Suit Supreme Court, Civil Suit Supreme Court 3 of 2016, Usain Udabo and 19 others against the Inspector General of Police, the Director of National Intelligence Agency, and the Attorney General. The case was had by Mr. Jallo, Mr. Justice, Chief Justice, Justice, Mr. Justice Jallo. The Learned Chief Justice of the Gambia, at page 2 of his judgment, had this to say after the Attorney General had applied to the police to abandon the statement of case filed on behalf of his predecessor. The Chief Justice said, takes judicial knowledge of the fact that in two, January 2017, there was a change in the Gambia. When the case came up for hearing before the full court on 26th May 2017, the new Attorney General, Abu Bakar Tambadu, appearing in person and on behalf of the other defendants, indicated to the court that the defendants had wished for the matter to be resolved other than through litigation, in view of what the learned Attorney General described as the public commitment of the new government to uphold the rights and freedoms of the citizens. The learned Attorney General stated that the defendants have determined that they can no longer defend the position taken by the defendants prior to the change of government. That as a result, the defendants wish to abandon their statement of case in this suit. That for the avoidance of doubt, the defendants admit that the prayers sought by the plaintiff are in accordance with the relevant provisions of the Constitution. In short, the defendants are no longer contesting the claims of the plaintiffs. Their Yes, subscribe. You always the watch we program them, but you not subscribe yet to the channel. All wait till you get for do, press this red subscribe button, and then you come over here to and press this bell. So the bell, bell option, press this one with all. A don't do and not get for cost you anything. When you do Any this, now sign for show say you the support we for make we do more. The Thank you for your effort for share this program. Yeah, God bless you. of protective provisions. Those provisions are set out in section 16 to 27. They are not re fully rehearsed here, but include the right to life, protection from arbitrary arrest or detention, protection from slavery and forced labor, and protection from inhuman treatment the right to a fair trial and protection from discrimination. Significantly, in the context of this matter, elections, whether parliamentary or presidential, do not fall under the protect provisions. Section 28.6 provides that when this court is dealing with a referral that concerns any of the protected provisions, it shall consist of, and I quote, not less than five justices, end of course. Inconsistency between the two. I now turn to section one of the Constitution. This section sets out the powers of the exercise in its jurisdiction. It states, and I quote, a single justice of the Supreme Court acting in its criminal jurisdiction and three justices of the Supreme Court acting in civil, civil jurisdiction may exercise any power vested in the Supreme Court not involving the decision of a cause or matter before the Supreme Court, save that in criminal matters, if any such justice is refused or grants an opportunity to exercise any such power, any person affected thereby shall be entitled to have the application determined by the Supreme Court, constituted by three justices, there and be in civil matters any order, 
direct decision made or given by the feeders in pursuance of the past conferred action may be discharged or reversed by the court constituted by five justices thereof. End of quote. Section 47.3 of the PEA 2012 is civil, not criminal. However, before considering the impact of Section 1 to 6 of the Constitution on it, we must first determine whether an objection brought under Section 47.3 is an interlocutory matter. I observe in passing that Section 1 to 6 is an exception to the requirements of Section 1 to 1 2 because it permits the business of the court to be conducted by a single judge instead of three when dealing with interlocutory criminal matters. Under the PEA 2012, the jurisdiction for determining an objection against the nomination of a candidate is conferred upon the Supreme Court. If the court upholds the objection, then this is of the issue, and the court must then the presidential candidate concerned to be disqualified from contesting the presidential election pursuant from Section 47.4 of the PEA 2012. It follows from the above that in dealing with an objection on the 47.3 of the Supreme Court, on the 47.3, the Supreme Court is not dealing to locatory matter, but is acting in a court and in furtherance of a jurisdiction expressly conferred upon PEA 2012 as permitted by Section 122 of the Constitution, and as such, its decision is final. Not that this is not an interlocutory matter. It is clear that when dealing with such matters, there can be no question of inconsistency or incompatibility unless three justices panel to deal with a matter concerning a protective provision. The fact that a decision by a panel of three may be varied, discharged, or reversed by a panel of five reflects that the interlocutory matter is not decisive of an issue and allows for the matter to be revisited before before the hand is finally determined, if there are compelling reasons to do so. Our constitution is not unique in this regard. By virtue of section 121 of the 1992 of Ghana, the court consists of the chief justice and not less than nine justices. This is the equivalent of our own section 121. The equivalent of our um, 1212 is section 1282, which states that the Supreme Court is, and I quote, duly constituted for its work by not less than five Supreme Court justices, except as otherwise provided by Article 3 of this Constitution. End of quote. Section 133 is a provision of review of decisions, a provision which we do not have in our own Constitution. However, Section 134 is the of our Section 26. A single justice of the Supreme Court may exercise power vested in the Supreme Court, not involving the decision of the cause for the Supreme Court. Save that in criminal matters, a decision litigant may go before a panel of three justices, the same as for our civil matters, when the decision may, where the decision may be very charged or it may be. Similarly, in Kenya, Constitution of Kenya 2010, this court consists of the Chief Justice, the Deputy Chief Justice, and five other justices. See Section 161. Section 132 is the equivalent of our Section 1212. This court is properly constituted for the purposes of, of its if it composes if it's composed of judges. It is therefore indisputable, in my view, the application under Section 47.3 of the PEA falls within the jurisdiction of this court. It follows that the requirement in the section for three justices to make a decision within 30 days is entirely consistent and compatible with Section 1212 of the Constitution. For the purposes of the election calendar, speedy and efficient disposal of applications and challenges are extremely important. This is not inconsistent with the ruling of this court in the case of Dr. Sylvia Blyden, Dr. Samuel Kamara, and numbers 6 of 2008 and 7 of 2008, that the rules to invoke in the, the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is by originating notice of motion. The fact that the Supreme Court rules state that the filing should be done within 10 days does not mean that parties should wait until the 10th day to file. In cases where urgency is required, 
the court would expect parties and where applicable the court to have served the relevant documents well before the time limit for service expires and not to the day limit it is the case that in the recent past including in this case this court has departed from its laid down rules on time when the urgency of the situation demanded it when the court is dealing with a matter which by law it needs to rule upon within 30 days then time limits will be strictly enforced so that the court has at most 10 days to consider and deliver its ruling the issue here is not the process but rather the substance of the relevant and applicable sections i shall now turn to the matters raised by the parties and i shall confine myself to the following a the plaintiff's reason for withdrawal of his action as stated in his affidavit sworn to on the 28th march 2018 and attached to his notice of motion b the request by the seventh defendant to determine the order prayed for in a, of the plaintiff's original notice of motion regardless of his motion withdrawal and section 61a of the cost alone 1991 notice of motion for withdrawal it is clear that the purpose and objection objective of this was as stated in paragraph i of the orders prayed for in the originating notice of motion dated 5th february 2018 that is the disqualification of the first defendant rather than simply file an objection as prescribed in section 42 of the pea the plaintiff sought to secure us route thereby wasting valuable court time and courts in and costs in this process the reason stated by the plaintiff for seeking to discontinue the matter in his affidavit sworn to on the 28th of march 2018 which supports notice of motion for discontinuance of the same date is that he is now satisfied that the first defendant had renounced his u.s citizenship and was therefore and was therefore qualified to stand in the parliamentary and presidential elections accepting as we must that the plaintiff is now genuinely satisfied that the issue of whether the first defendant had renounced his citizenship which is a question of fact that does not require the constitution to be interpreted it follows that the action brought by the plaintiff is at best ill-conceived and at worst frivolous and vexatious it is clear that the plaintiff did not need the court's interpretation of the various sections of the constitution and the Sierra Leone citizenship act 1973 as amended when he filed his originating notice of motion dated 5th february 2018 the inescapable reality of the plaintiff's stance is that either he had no difficulty interpreting the relevant provisions of the constitution or that realizing that the first defendant was no longer a u.s citizen he had an epiphany, the result of which was that he was suddenly enlightened about the various sections he needed interpreted either way it traced that the action as filed was wholly without merit it ought not to need stating that the courts in general and court in particular should not be used as a political weapon in order to achieve gain. The rule of law, an effective democracy, requires strong and independent institutions of which this judiciary is and must be seen to be one. The courts must therefore guard against attempts to abuse its process for the sake of political expediency disguised as an application for interpretation it will not have escaped the attention of most right thinking that the very topic of this action nationality and citizenship was toxically divisive and menacing at a time when national cohesion and good citizenry was most important it's hardly needs stating that this country's recent history to the conduct of the king police.
the determination of paragraph H of the plaintiff's originating notice of motion. The defendants have all stated in open court that they are not averse to the discontinuance subject to costs. The second defendant, though represented, made no representations, nor was any case on his behalf. However, the seventh defendant has asked that given the importance of the matters raised, the court should determine the order prayed for in paragraph H of the plaintiff's originating notice of motion and make a declaration as follows, I quote, any person who upon attaining the age of 22 years or is a citizen of Sierra Leone and also a citizen of any other country did and does not by operation of law or any other means cease to be a Sierra Leonean end of quote. This declaration is sought despite the fact that section 10 of the Sierra Leone Citizenship Amend Amendment Act 2006, the 2006 Act, repealed of the section, section 11 of the 1973 Act stated as follows, I quote, a person who upon attaining the age of 22 years is a citizen of Leon and also a citizen of another country shall cease to be a citizen of Sierra Leone upon attaining the age of 22 years or in the case of a person of unsound mind at such later date as may be prescribed unless he has complied with paragraph A, B, and C of section 9, end of quote. For reference, section 9 deals with citizenship by naturalization. Section 10 of the 2006 amendment reads as follows, I quote, a citizen of Sierra Leone may hold the citizenship of another country in addition to his citizenship of Sierra Leone, end of quote. As stated above, this amendment repeals the aforementioned section 11 of the 1973 Act. Counsel for the seventh defendant, however, urged this court to deal with the issue because the seventh defendant is a political party, I quote, with obligations to promote and protect the rights and interests of its membership, whether in or out of Sierra Leone, and to the entire nation. And as a matter of law, where there is an act of parliament that changes previous legislation, unless the new legislation preserves particular sections of that previous legislation, then the supervision, supervening legislation overrides the previous law. And this court will not entertain a futile, futile consideration of, of provisions that have no relevance or applicability to the law as it currently stands. I agree with the submission of counsel for the first defendant that the proper role of this court is to interpret and pronounce on the effect of subsisting legislation and not to offer an opinion on the effect in law before the coming into force of any amendment. However, this court recognizes that the matter having been raised has created unnecessary uncertainty and as a result has become an issue of immense importance. To allow this uncertainty to continue would have far-reaching and unintended consequences affected, affecting citizens who are dual nationals, whether they live in Sierra Leone or not. It therefore falls this court to remove any uncertainty that remains, even though the plaintiff now seeks to do this action. In doing so, I have relied on the various statements of case filed by the parties. Apart from nationalization, Sierra Leone citizenship can be acquired the following way, pursuant to the 1973 Act as amended. Section 2, citizenship, citizenship by birth. Every person who having been born in Sierra Leone before the 19th day of April 1971, or who was resident in Sierra Leone on the 18th day of April 1971, and not the subject of any other state, shall on the 19th day of April 1971 be deemed to be a citizen of Sierra Leone by birth, provided that A, his father or grandfather was born in Sierra Leone, and B, he's a person of Negro African descent. Section 3, citizenship by birth in Sierra Leone. Every person in Sierra Leone, on or after the 19th day of April 1971, 
in the circumstances set out in Section 2 shall be deemed to be a citizen of Sierra Leone by birth. Section 4, citizenship by birth outside Sierra Leone. Every person born or resident outside Sierra Leone or not before the 18th day of April 1971 and who but for such birth or residence out of, outside of Sierra Leone would be a citizen of Sierra Leone by virtue of Section 2 shall on the 19th day of April 1971 be deemed to be a citizen of Sierra Leone by birth. Section 5, citizenship by descent. Every person born outside Sierra Leone on or after the 19th day of April 1971 of a father who was or would but for his death have been a citizen of Sierra Leone by virtue of sections 2, 3 and 4 is a citizen of Sierra Leone by birth. Six, other category of citizenship. Every person whose mother is or was a citizen of Sierra Leone by virtue of sections 2, 3, 4, and 5, and who does not or did not acquire the citizenship of another state, shall be deemed citizenship, a citizen of Sierra Leone by birth. Counsel for the plaintiff's argument was that section 11 of the 1973 Act is mandatory, clear, and emphatic. See section 10 of the plaintiff's statement of case. That the words, I quote, shall cease, imposes a mandatory and or compulsory compliance with the Act and admits no discretion or contrary interpretation other than the ordinary meaning as stated and or conveyed therein. He, stated, he further stated that there is no ambiguity or lacuna and that the section is plain and clear. I have considered the arguments advanced by counsel for the first defendant in his statement of case. At paragraph 87, he states as follows. It is admitted that the section did state that the consequences then of the possession of another citizenship, dual nationality. If possession of dual nationality was intended to affect the loss of citizenship of Sierra Leone, the section was glaringly silent on this. At best, it could only have operated, if at all, as a ground or reason for non-recognition of the other nationality when set against Sierra Leone nationality. For such an important matter involving loss of citizenship, it is submitted that it could not be implied by any and proper reading of the section, end of quote. As stated earlier, the question of this court is to interpret and give effect to the law as it currently stands. Section 10 of the Citizenship, Salient Citizenship Amendment Act 2006 repeals Section 11 of the 1973 Act in its entirety. As a result, Section 11 does not represent the law it currently stands. All matters concerning citizenship are to be considered only by reference to the sections of the 1973 Act that were not repealed and the provisions of the 2006 Act. It follows that the provisions of the Section 11 of the 1973 Act are obsolete and require no interpretation or guidance from this Court. For the avoidance of doubt, save for the exceptions provided for in the Constitution, there is no bar to holders of dual citizenship holding public office or exercising any of the rights afforded to any Sierra Leonean citizen, to all Sierra Leonean citizens. Those rights are clearly set, set out in both the 1973 Act, that is the unrepealed sections, and the Amendment Act of 2006. Therefore, in the circumstances of this case, the declaration sought is unnecessary. A consideration of Section 11 of the 1973 Act would only be necessary if, which it is not the case and is unlikely to ever be the case, the court was being invited to consider an election that had taken place prior to Section 11 being repealed. I shall now turn to Section 176.1a of the Constitution. I will address this issue that ex sorry, I will address the issue that exercised much debate in the run-up to the elections, and which formed the basis of the answer sought in A to 4, and the declaration sought in paragraphs C, D, E, and F of the originating notice of motion namely whether section 761a of the constitution disqualifies Sierra Leoneans who hold dual citizenship from standing for parliament. I address this issue because, as I said in paragraph 26 above, this matter having been raised is of 
importance. Additionally, this action is no ordinary action. It is not an appeal that can be abandoned or an issue which raises a question of facts that can be settled. This is a fundamental constitutional issue which raises serious questions for the democracy of this country. It would therefore be a serious failing of this court if we allowed the application of withdrawal without expressing an opinion on this important issue. The court would lay itself open to the suggestion that it had sacrificed clarity and certainty at the altar of expediency and convenience, or, as I stated earlier, allow itself to be used in this way. Further, it is in my view that the raised in the declaration sought by the seventh defendant, a political party, can only be addressed and dealt with decisively by consideration of Section 761A. That said, Section 761A must be interpreted in a manner that is consistent with the will of Parliament as evinced in the 2006 Citizenship Act. Prior to the 2006 Prior well, to 2006, it was not lawful for Sierra Leoneans to hold dual citizenship. Section 761A therefore did no more than reflect the law as it stood then. Since 2006, it has been lawful and permissible for Sierra Leoneans to hold dual nationality. Section 173 of the Constitution Section 173 of the Constitution foreshadowed that the law concerning citizenship might change and provided that any, and I quote, act relating to citizenship should be amended, repealed, re enacted, or replaced unless the bill in such amendments, enactment, or replacement is supported at the final vote thereupon by the votes of not less than two-thirds of the members of the par of parliament, end of quote. This is just as well, because our constitution is unique in that unlike so many others in Africa, it does not deal with citizenship and the qualifications for attaining such. The significance of section 173 is that it allows parliament's constitutional provisions it allows Parliament to amend constitutional provisions. And when this happens, the pertinent provision, in this case 761A, is superseded by the new provision. Section 761A is therefore subject to the relevant provisions of the Citizenship Act 2006, assuming, as we must, that two-thirds of the members of Parliament voted to enact it. This court Court has in the past adopted the purposive approach to statutory interpretation in interpreting other sections of our Constitution. See Charles F. Magai versus S. E. Bera and another, S. E. 2 of 2007, 3rd, 3rd August 2007, unreported by U. H. Tijanjalo, J. S. C. See also Serial Enterprises versus Attorney General and Minister of Justice, S. E. 4, 2005. 18th July 2008, unreported. In the latter case, Rhodes Viva JSC rel relied on the Privy Council decision in AG of the Gambia versus Muhammadu Job, 1984, appeal cases 689, at page 700. There, Lord Diplock stated in the area, I quote, a constitution, and in particular that which protects and entrenches fundamental rights and freedoms to which all persons in the state are to be entitled is to be given a generous and safe construction, end of quote. Similarly, Nigerian Supreme Court case of Nafiu Rabiu versus the state, 1981, 2 NCLR 293 at page 326, Udo Udoma, JSC, stated, and I quote, where the question is whether the Constitution has used an expression in the wider or in the narrower sense, in my view, this court should, whenever possible, and in the response to the demands of justice, lean to the broader interpretation, unless there is something in the text 
the rest of the constitution to indicate that the Nawa interpretation will best carry out the objects and purposes of the constitution, end of quote. There's no reason to deviate from the, that approach now. Several English authorities have also adopted the same approach to statutory interpretation. In the case of Monsell and Orling's 1975 appeal cases 373, Lord Simons explained the approach as follows. I quote, the first task of a court of construction is to put itself in the drafts manner, to consider what knowledge he had, and importantly, what statutory objective he had being thus placed the court proceeds to ascertain the meaning of the statutory language, end of quote. As previously stated, Section 761A gave effect to the Citizenship Act 1973, which self-evidently was, was the governing and applicable act when the Constitution was passed. However, 761A in accordance with Section 173, Section 176.1a should be read as now giving effect to the citizenship. Beg your pardon, I'll read that again. I'm sorry. However, in accordance with section 173, section 761a should be read as now giving the Citizenship Amendment Act 2006. The Constitution is a living document, and as Lord Bingham stated in the case of R versus Secretary of State for Health, ex parte Quinterval, 2003, two appeal cases 687. There is, I quote, there is no inconsistency between the rule that statutory language retains the meaning it had when Parliament used it and the rule that a statute is always speaking. If Parliament, however long ago, passed an act applicable to dogs, it could not properly be interpreted to apply to cats but it could properly be held to apply to animals which were not regarded as dogs when the act was passed but are so regarded now end of quote in the english case of the royal college of nursing of the united kingdom and the department of health and social security 1981 appeal 80 at page 822 a case which concerned the abortion act 1967 in that jurisdiction and whether nurses could lawfully take part in the termination procedure not known when the act was passed. Lord Wilberforce stated, and I quote, in interpreting an act of parliament, it is proper and indeed necessary to have regard to the state of affairs existing and known to parliament to be existing at the time. It is a fair presumption that parliament's policy or intention is directed to that state of affairs. Leaving aside cases of omission by inadvertence, this being no such case, when a new set of affairs or fresh set of facts being on policy comes into existence, the courts have to consider whether they fall within the parliamentary intention. They may be held to do so if they fall within the same genus of facts as those to which the express policy have been formulated. They may also be held to do so if there can be detected or clear purpose in the legislation which can be fulfilled if the extension is made. How these principles may be applied must depend upon the nature of the enactment and the strictness or otherwise of the words in which it has been expressed. The court should be less willing to extend express meanings if it is clear that the act in question was designed to be restrictive or circumscribed in its operations rather than liberal or permissive. This will be much less willing, they will be much worse will do so where the subject matter is different in kind or dimension from which the legislation was passed. In any event, there is one course which the course cannot take on of this country. They cannot fill gaps. They cannot by asking the question, what would Parliament have done in its current case, not being one in contemplation, if the facts for it attempt themselves to apply the answer if the answer is not to be found in the terms of the act itself, end of quote. Another illustration of interpretation of a statute to reflect current circumstances is the extension of the term bodily harm in the offenses against the person act 1861 to mean psychiatric harm, a concept which was unknown at the time of passing the legislation. Chan Fook, 1991, 
one weekly law report 687 and r versus Boston subnum r versus ireland 1998 appeal cases 147. conclusion if as stated above the constitution is a living document then it must adapt and respond to changes in society's attitudes from time to time parliament steps in for example of Estates Act 2007 and its effect on Section 274D of the Constitution, insofar as marriage of a state on death and other interests of personal law are concerned. And more recently, um, the past abolition of Death Penalty Act 2001, 2021, for certain offenses, murder, treason, robbery with aggravation and its effect on 16.1 of the Constitution. The same can be said for the 2006 Act. It could not surely have been the intent of Parliament to give to some of its citizens a right, whilst leaving in place positions which deprive them of the benefit of that same right. On the occasions where Parliament does not act, this Court must step in to ensure that the Constitution or any enactment is interpreted to reflect society's evolution and progressive attitudes, particular towards gender, tribe, religion, race, or citizenship, so that no one group or part of a group is left out of an inclusive society. In doing so, this Court must be careful to ensure that it is not making any new law but merely interpreting that which already exists in a manner consistent with the will of Parliament. It follows that the changes by the 2006 Act are in accordance with the Constitution. The 2006 Act does not restrict the rights of any category of citizens and self-evidently does not discriminate against any citizen who holds dual nationality. Section 76 of the Constitution must be considered in the light of Section 173, which gave Parliament the discretion to legislate in respect of matters concerning citizenship. Parliament, in its wisdom, has decided that it should not be unlawful for Sierra Leoneans to hold another nationality. The mischief against which Section 76-1A was aimed is no longer in existence. Indeed, what was once unlawful is now lawful. It follows, a fortiori, that there is no automatic disqualification by virtue only of holding dual or multiple citizenship. The effect is that the disqualification of Sierra Leonean citizens who voluntarily hold citizenship of another country by virtue of Section 761A is now only relevant to elections, con elections conducted before to the 2006 Act was passed. If it needs stating, the law as it now stands is that Sierra Leonean citizens who are voluntarily citizens of another country are no longer disqualified from standing for Parliament. The only citizens with dual nationality excluded under Section 761A are naturalized citizens given that only citizens other than naturalized citizens are qualified under section 75 gentlemen go on. i'll have to go over that again please the only citizens with dual nationality excluded under section 761a are naturalized citizens given that only citizens other than natural citizens are qualified under section 75 of the constitution to such time as Parliament amends the law, this disqualification remains in force. Thank you. I have the honor of reading the decisions of Ralph Mark JSC, Glenna Thompson JSC, and Robert JSC.
This case primarily deals with the question of who is a citizen of Sierra Leone under the Constitution of Sierra Leone for the purpose of contesting presidential and parliamentary elections. And at what point in time that person loses his citizenship and whether having lost, he could regain it at a later date and the procedure to be followed. Section 127, 1 and 2 of the 1991 Constitution deals with the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. It gives the Supreme Court original jurisdiction to interpret a statute. It provides dots, I quote, a person who alleges that an enactment or anything contained in or any other enactment is inconsistent with or is in contravention of the provision of this constitution may at any time bring an action in the Supreme Court for a declaration to that effect, end of quote. Section 1272 states, I quote, the Supreme Court shall, for the purpose of a declaration under that section 1, make such orders and give such directions as it may consider appropriate for giving effect to or enabling effect to be given to the declaration so made, end of quote. During the course of the proceedings, the plaintiff discontinued the entire action against the defendants. This was clearly an unacceptable conduct. Democracy and good governance demands that those conduct which undermine democracy and good governance ought not to be encouraged. The plaintiff's conduct was not but a recipe for chaos. The first defendant was removed from the ballot box days to the general election and not too long, the plaintiff, after the conduct of the general, is filed a notice of discontinuance. It is clearly an abuse of process. The plaintiff, David Fona, on the 5th of February 2018, filed a notice of motion posing certain questions, calling on this court to answer, and if they were answered in a certain manner, several declarations were also sought in the same motion paper. The plaintiff asked this court firstly to interpret sections 41, 75, and 76 of the 1991 Constitution of Sierra Leone. The effect of interpretation of these provisions will help determine the following. One, whether a naturalized citizen of Sierra Leone is disqualified from being elected as a member of parliament and thereby also disqualified to be elected president. Two, whether a citizen of a country other than Sierra Leone, having become one voluntarily or is under a declaration of allegiance to such a country, is disqualified from being elected as a member of parliament. If the answer to questions one is permitted, what is the effect in law of a naturalized citizen running for election as a member of parliament and consequently for the office of President, if the answer to question two is in the affirmative, what is the effect of such a citizen running for parliament as council and also for the office of president? The plaintiff has also posed for determination the interpretation of sections five and seven of the Sierra Leone Citizenship Act 1973 as amended by Act No. 2006. A, whether upon a proper construction of Section 10 of the 1973 Act as amended and before coming into force of the Amendment Act, a person having Sierra Leone citizenship and any other citizenship at one and the same time by operation of law cease to be a Sierra Leonean. B, whether upon interpretation of Section 11 of the 1973 Citizenship Act as amended, before the coming into effect of the 2000 Amendment Act, upon attaining the age of 22 years, being a citizen of Sierra Leone and also a citizen of another country by operation of law, cease to be a citizen of Sierra Leone. If the answer to question one is in the affirmative, can such a person be eligible to contest parliamentary and presidential election? The plaintiff sought the following declarations. One, that by virtue of section 41, 75, and 76 
of our constitution of Sierra Leone, no person shall be qualified to be elected as a member of parliament or president if he's a naturalized person. Two, by virtue of section 41, 75, and 76 of our constitution, no person shall be qualified to be elected as a member of parliament or president if he is a citizen of a country other than having become a citizen voluntarily or is under a declaration of allegiance to the other country. Part of section 10 and 11 of the 1970 Act, a of Sierra Leone who was also a citizen of another country ceased to be a Sierra Leonean. This defendant on of March 2018 filed a state of case. In summary, it contains several averments, and in particular, he avers he is a citizen by birth and descent. He further averred that he acquired in 1975 a U.S. citizenship, but renounced it in November 2017, long before the 2018 elections. He supported this by filing an affidavit on the 19th of March 2018, verifying same. He attached to his affidavit documents such as his birth certificate, his current Sierra Leone passport, his certificate of American nationality, together with who his oath and affirmation of renunciation of American nationality and nomination certificates for parliamentary and presidential elections. There is no statement of case by the second defendant. The third and fourth defendants filed a joint statement of case. The seventh also filed a statement of case. This court of March 2018 ordered the statement of case to be filed in respect of the fifth, sixth, and seventh defendants. The declaration sought by the seventh defendants referred to not only the provisions of the laws, the citizen laws, but also the interpretation of section 751A of the 1991 Constitution. Section 75 one, section 761A of the 1991 Constitution, sorry. The seven defendants' argument is that a naturalized citizen cannot contest for membership of a parliament. His submission is grounded on constitutional provisions, section 76 one of the 1991 Constitution, which provides those I quote, persons shall be qualified for election as a member of parliament. A, if he's a naturalized citizen of Sierra Leone or a citizen of a country other than Sierra Leone having become such a citizen voluntarily or is under a declaration of allegiance to such a country. Upon a plain and literal reading provision of the constitution, it is arguably the case, it is arguably the case that no person qualified for election as a member of parliament where is a life citizen of Sierra Leone or a citizen of a country other than Sierra Leone, such citizenship having been obtained voluntarily or the individual in question is under a declaration of allegiance to such a country. It is safe to conclude that at the time the 1991 constitution was enacted, the concept of dual nationality was not part of the laws of Sierra Leone. The 1973 Citizenship Act. Under the 73 Citizenship Act, Section 2 provides every person who having been born in Sierra Leone before the 19th day of April 1971 and not the subject of any other state shall on the 19th day of April 1971 be deemed to be a citizen of Sierra Leone by birth, provided A, his father or his grandfather was born in Sierra Leone, B is a person of Negro African descent that any person of Sierra Leonean parentage who carries a foreign citizenship and is past the age of majority was automatically deemed to have lost their Sierra Leonean citizenship in court. The effect of the 73 legislation was twofold. Firstly, it provided the manner in which citizenship was acquired and it also made provision for the manner in which citizenship was automatically lost in a situation where a person who had acquired citizenship by section 2 loses that citizenship where is a subject of another state and or carries a foreign citizenship after the age of 21. 
where such citizenship is lost in the manner provided for under the plain intention of Parliament was that a non-citizen a non-citizen cannot qualify for membership of Sierra Leone Parliament. The Sierra Leone Citizenship Amendment Act 2006. This was an act of Parliament that was enacted to amend the Sierra Leone Citizenship Act of 1973. The effect of the amendment of this act is that citizenship is no longer lost or deemed to be automatically lost by acquisition or possession of citizenship of another state. The provisions of Section 75 are subject to the provisions of Section 76 only in respect to limited category of citizenship acquired otherwise than by birth. The rules of scarcity interpretation require words to be given their natural or ordinary meaning without putting words on it. Its true construction by way of the literal rule a citizen of Sierra Leone as provided for in Section 75 for the purposes of Section 75, notwithstanding that he is a citizen of a country of another of and that is a citizen of a country other than Sierra Leone, having become such a citizen voluntarily or is under a declaration of to such a country. A citizen of Sierra acquired citizenship by registration and naturalization and arguably excluded provisions of Section 75 and 76 from being eligible to contest for membership of parliament purposive approach to statutory interpretation. Lord Simon explained the purposive approach and Orleans 1975 appeals 373 in this is quote the first of a court of construction to put itself in this of the draftsman to consider what knowledge he had an important statutory objective he had end of quote being thus placed the court proceeds to ascertain the meaning in statutory language this is sometimes referred to as the to statutory interpretation in leader and Duffy, teen appeal cases to lord horsbury lord charles appeal i quote but i add you must look at the of the instrument as a whole in order to give it effect if it's possible to do so to the intention of the framers of it. Lord Justice Lord's Court of Appeal in Oliver Ashworth Holdings Limited and Ballard Kent Limited 1999 to all England law reports at page 799 had it to had this to say it is now this and perhaps it's always was to seek to draw a rigid distinction between literal purposive approaches to the interpretation of acts of parliament the difference between the purposive and literal construction is in truth one of degree only the real distinction on the balance to be struck popular case between the meaning of the words on the one hand and the context and purpose of the measure in which they appear on the end of quote. The first defendant has deposed in his affidavit that he carries a Sierra Leone passport and had keen interest in the socio economic and political processes of his native land. The plaintiff has failed to provide any evidence to the court. In my view, the plaintiff is aware of the status of the first defendant prior to March 2018. Section 41 of the 1990 Constitution deals with the eligibility candidate for presidential election. One of the criteria is that he should be qualified to be elected as a member of parliament. This criteria is connected with Section 75 and Section 76 1 of the 1991 Constitution. He clearly met the criteria. The first defendant is a Sierra Leonean by birth and not a naturalized citizen. He has American citizenship long before nomination. 
the plaintiff again was aware of this fact in the result the claim fails the declaration sought by the seven defendant is hereby granted i declare that any person who upon attainment of 21 years was or is a citizen of sierra leone and also a citizen in any other country did and does not by operation of law or any other means cease to be a sierra leonean the plaintiff shall be added to the action up to the date it was discovered in favor of the first 12 court defendants. Just for five minutes, please. Yes, subscribe. You always the watch we program them, but you not subscribe yet to the channel. All wait till you get for do, press this red subscribe button, and then you come over here to and press this bell. To the bell option, press this one with all. And don't don't. And no get for cost you anything. When you do this, na sign for show say you the support we for make we do more. Thank you for all your help we for share this program. Yeah, God bless you. Yes, subscribe. You always the watch we program them, but you not subscribe yet to the channel. All wait till you get for do, press this red subscribe button, and then you come over here to and press this bell. To the bell option, press this one with all. And don't don't. And no get for cost you anything. When you do this, na sign for show say you the support we for make we do more. Thank you for all your help we for share this program. Yeah, God bless you. Yes, subscribe. You always the watch we program them, but you not subscribe yet to the channel. All wait till you get for do, press this red subscribe button, and then you come over here to and press this bell. To the bell option, press this one with all. And don't don't. And no get for cost you anything. When you do this, na sign for show say you the support we for make we do more. Thank you for all your help we for share this program. Yeah. What is now abundantly clear is that the 10 years of APC misrule has, and economic mismanagement has definitely created considerable suffering for the people of this country. From Kamakuya to Pujehu, from Kono to Freetown and everywhere, people are suffering under the weight of corruption and the mismanagement of the All People's Congress. 
I have seen it at first hand from Falaba to Kenima and uh, from Kailan to Putloko. The people want change. The people are tired of, and, uh, of the suffering of paying for a bag of rice at 200,000 from only 60,000 in 2007. The people want democratic change to change to end their suffering. But what type of change do we want for this great nation? What type of change do we want for our the children's future? Um, as a nation, I want to make you understand one thing that there is no quick fix to national issues or problems. If we want to bring happiness, it's not going to be in two years or three years. With COVID, we don't take already one year. We make, we know the meat, we know the, as we talk, we go for cover, we not we know the, the whole world come to a standstill. But what we don't do is, now forgive hope, say, what we we'll say we we'll go do, we don't start for do a lot of things in there, under very difficult circumstances at the time, at this particular point in time. And it really hurts. It's when you listen to people who want to rule a country without clear understanding of how the country's economy works, what the sectors are important for the economy, what policies are necessary to improve on the economy. But what is more worrying is when people talk without a sense of history, Going back to where they came from, Brigadier Madabu talks about reckless expenditure. I was a financial secretary in this country when the NPRC was here. When he ruled as uh, head of state for three months, you understand? I know exactly, as manager of the economy, manager of the budget, how we were constrained by the fact that what we call extra budgetary revenues were not paid into the budget. One particular one was we got 18 million US dollars from the sale of Ilmanite. That was never reported to us. We collected the money. It was not paid into the budget. Is that, was that good expenditure? No, I'm just coming. Because you're not going to know where they are outside. Now, where you can inside, now you didn't know the, 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 the actual nature. The, the magnitude, enormity of the problem, and then you, all you manifest the thing that you get for tweak them, adjust them, for make you able to tackle them problems then they We have added another problem which is making things even worse, which is taking us backwards and not forward. And what is that? It is the seeming policy of division and exclusion, marginalization of a certain group. That is not good for business. The political instability and tension is not encouraging investment. Division on tribal lines does not consolidate peace. It perpetuates resentment. Now, yesterday, in the opening statement of our leaders, we were inspired in so many ways that we saw that our leaders, for the first time, admitting to faults and willing to take responsibility but we also see that there is a big gap between rhetoric and reality. We are preaching peace, yet we are undermining those institutions that foster peace. We can give countless examples, but I don't want to bore you right now with examples. Let me just mention you. cannot preach peace and you're sacking people who are guaranteed with security of tenure under the constitution and the statute. Yes.
They have received me letter now from the HR. This is my letter of termination of contract. SSL. This is termination of service. Um, they are going to cry foul, as you know. Uh, we have to change certain people when we come in. It's done all over the world. Biden did his, and nobody will accuse him of tribalism, <laughs> regionalism, and that's the same thing that is done in the UK and elsewhere around the world. But for the most part, we have not pushed out anybody from the civil service. But in certain offices, you'd expect that uh, somebody shouldn't lose their job because, you know, of a change in establishment. Like which office? Like in certain parastatals, lots of people lost their jobs when he became president. Not I'm, necessarily I'm, because of a fraudulently or I'm, I'm going to be, I'm recruited. going to be I'm going to be judged by my performance and delivery. If you are in the opposition and you are going to be a hurdle in my way, I have to get somebody who understands me, who believes in my own um, 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 manifesto uh, uh, pledges. A hurdle, a hurdle by not supporting you or a hurdle by undermining your establishment or what? Both. <laughs> Both. They do a range of things. You know, with the completely unnecessary. I Should somebody lose their job, Mr. President, because they did not support you? I did not talk about support. He said both, Mr. President. Maybe if somebody does not support me, he is likely to be an, a, a hordu. Much more likely to be a hordu. You cannot preach peace and you impose a speaker on parliament against the majority party in parliament. We cannot preach peace when it seems like appointments are being done on tribal lines. Those people don't they raise concern, but the way a manner how price they go up and thin in a market. Some of them business people here talk say they self business not easy for them, and not to them fault make price they go up because then self they sell according to how they buy. I think we're in a very precarious and very sad position, um, and you're quite right. I, I I have been away for a couple of for a month, and. I come back and the day I arrive, it's a, a, a dollar was 10,000 mm. and 20 or 30, 30 leons. And every time you go to bed and you wake up, the dollar has gone up. And before coming to your studio, I checked on my phone. Mm. And lo and behold, a dollar is now worth 11,200 leons. Mm. I mean, this is not rocket science. Sierra Leone imports more than we export. Right. So we are 100% dependent on the dollar. So it, it's, it's not surprising that we're seeing, as the dollar is going crazy, the exchange rate is going crazy, the price of commodities is going along with it. I mean, I go to the market. I go to the market a lot. And I... <laughs> I'm like, how is the average Sahelonian managing to put food on their table? Money. He left the make make money all the dumb. 
ultimate gear, you can't give it to go down well with you. Ah, we the the stuff and the book. It's bad what they're telling us, so right now it's not easy for we. We the really strain at this country. Right now, price control not the aid. Every day we go now money at different price. Every day we go even turn at different price. It's not really easy for we. Right now, business, I wake up and this business, I don't pay attention for the other men. But it's not really easy for we. No profit at all they get right now on business. All team bad. The way you go ask the shopman, the way they tell them say they say they say they tax you every now and again. No, no, but to the GST, the GST way they give it, for pay for pay tax them. Now they make the price control so bad now the country. You don't see? The only thing I want to tell the government, most of some, most of the end they rich, they need to suffer. But we the poor one, the way back now we the suffer. And we the woman, then we the suffer because the man they not get forgiven. We the woman they suffer. And for this market, now we are both part. Let government try pay attention what I keep. Then they try reduce this tax when people they pay from the container. This business, what will they go for go buy? Oil. What will actually be the mass man? They say, hey, what may I put this oil off? They said you attack you 90 million. Okay, if you don't, if you don't go pay 90 million. So if I go send, or let's say pull your money where it takes don't spend all the pay the pension profit. So there are the best government, the government try to better things. Yeah. Let me let you understand this. I mean, it's very easy for people to bring politics into everything. Um, we have a price control mechanism at the Ministry of Trade, and it's at two levels. We look at what price control we have for wholesale goods. I mean, and we are in touch with manufacturers and importers, and we have a way of determining what the, the costs are, the, the, the cost factors or variables, and we are able to set at what price they should be selling um, various products. Mm -hmm. Take, for instance, rice. We are engaging with the importers. And because you realize that some of these variables have been moving, I mean, they've not been constant and they've not been jumping um, within a very long period. It's been moving almost regularly, frequently. You see that some of the prices have also been moving. But we have a price control. And as I speak to you, I've been having an engagement with the private sector. And at that level, you see that we are setting the price for how most of the imported products and even those produced locally are actually sold in the market. And at the local level, we have the um, trade monitors. And you have seen myself. I think there's, there's record. That I have been also been going down in the streets to actually check prices of commodities in shops. I mean, unfortunately, you cannot have um, the ministry cover every nook and corner of this country. We are talking about um, a manpower of about 90-something, 90 95 trade monitors dispersed all across the country. So you realize that there is a challenge there with manpower as well. But we've been trying as best as we can. The price control is not there. Mm. Even the Lebanese at the shop, you go this now as I tell you, you buy, you go back less than one minute, you know they say day again. You don't meet and go. Look yesterday, I go for buy, buy milk cow. Mm -hmm. Go buy 50,000. Now na sixty thousand. So now it don't go one five for one and I be one thousand. Mm. So you see huh? Well we have a huge big problem, Samuel. Mm. We have a government that portrays itself as a with these people have a qualification of any candidate under the but former the thing they do shall be subject to an appeal to the full panel. In order for you to be a good listener, you have to be able to consult. And you must be able to absorb different opinions that may not be yours. Those people don't they raise concern but the way a manner how price they go up and thin in a market. Some of them business people here talk say business business casting not easy for them. They know to them both snake price to go up because then self they sell according to how they buy. 
I think we're in a very precarious and very sad position. Um, and you're quite right. I, I, I have been away for a couple of, for a month, and I come back, and the day I arrive, it's a, a, a dollar was ten by five justices thereof. The side note to this provision clearly states that it relates to the powers of the Supreme Court in intermediate three matters. Subsection three of section 47 of the Public Elections Act 2012 provides as follows. Quote, an objection against the nomination of a presidential candidate shall be heard by the Supreme Court made up of three justices whose decision shall be given within 30 days of the lodging of the objection, unquote. A proper construction of the two provisions will reveal that there is no conflict. The objection to a candidate to participate in a presidential election, to my mind, could be equated to an interlocutory process. After the nomination, there will still be the presidential elections, which is the end process. It is only when there is a challenge to the results of a presidential election that the Supreme Court shall be called upon to determine its validity. Section 55 of the Public Elections Act 2012, number 4 of 2012, is clear on this point. It provides as follows. Quote, a person who is a citizen of Sierra Leone and has lawfully voted in a presidential election may challenge the validity of that election by petition to the Supreme Court within seven days after the declaration of the results of a presidential election under subsection 2 of section 52, unquote. It should be noted here that no reference is made to the number of Supreme Court judges, which would invariably lead to the conclusion that it must be the full panel of the court. Subsection 3 of Section 47 does clearly state that the decision of the panel of three is subject to an appeal to a panel of five, as provided for in Section 126 of the Constitution. Had Parliament intended that decision to be final, it would have said so. I say this because in Section 145, Subsection 1 of the said Act, which deals with parliamentary elections petitions, it is explicitly provided that, quote, an appeal shall lie to the Court of Appeal from the determination of the High Court upon an election petition, and the decision of the Court of Appeal shall be final to all intents and purposes." Unquote. There is no such specificity in subsection 3 of section 47. Within subsection 3 of 47 of Act No. 4 of 2012, subsection 4 of se section 43 of the same, and section 126 of the Constitution together, it is my opinion that any disqualification of any candidate under the former shall be subject to an appeal to the full panel of the Supreme Court. It, it is important to take into consideration that subsection 4 of section 47 only refers to the Supreme Court without mentioning the required quorum. Based on my opinion profiled in the following paragraphs, I hold that Subsection 3 of Section 47 of the Public Elections Act 2012 does not contravene Section 126 of the Constitution of Sierra Leone 1991, number 6 of 1991, but rather complements it. In any event, 
even if it does contradict it, the constitutional provision will take precedence. Now let me go to the issue in this case. The plaintiff in this matter unconditionally reduced his action against all the defendants before the hearing. This means that all the relief sought against the defendants ceased to exist. And so this court lacks jurisdiction to determine them in the manner in which they were raised. However, the application for this continuance was made after all the parties here have filed their respective statements of case. This gives this court a treasure trove of legal submissions and authorities to assist it in answering the questions asked. After arguments regarding the withdrawal, counsel for the seven defendant, Yasmin Pitu Sheriff, asked this court to determine the declaration prayed for in paragraph H of the originating notice of motion of the plaintiff dated the 5th day of February 2008 to wit. Quote, that by virtue of section 11 of the Swahili Citizenship Act number no. 4 of 1973 as amended, and before the coming to effect of the Swahili Citizenship Amendment Act number no. 11 of 2006, any person who upon attaining the age of 22 years being a citizen of Swahili and also a citizen of another country by operation of law ceased to be a citizen of Swahili, unquote. In our view, we are opposed. The said prayer is, is of such constitutional and public interest significance that it should, be, it should be clarified by the Supreme Court. In the statement of the plaintiff's case, counsel for the plaintiff at paragraph 3a refers to section 10 of the Swadian Citizenship Act No. 4 of 1973 as amended and the Swadian Citizenship Amendment Act No. 11 of 2006. For ease of reference, I shall reproduce these provisions. Section 11 of the Swadian Citizenship Act 1973 provides as follows. Quote, Any person who, upon attaining the age of 21 years, is a citizen of Swadian, who, upon attaining the age of 21 years, is a citizen of Sierra Leone and a citizen of another country, shall cease to be a citizen of Sierra Leone upon attaining the age of 21 years, or in the case of a person of unsound mind, as such later date as may be prescribed, unless he has complied with paragraphs A, B, C of Section 9. Section 10 of the Sierra Leone Citizenship Act 1973 provides as follows. Quote, no person shall have Swahili citizenship and any other citizenship at one and the same time, unquote. <coughs> Swahili Citizenship Act No. 13 of 1976, Section 9 deals with conditions precedent to the grant of certificate of citizenship by naturalization. In this submission, Mr. Santos Macaulay, counsel for the plaintiff argues that sections 10 and 11 of the 1973 act as amended are mandatory clear and emphatic terms more specific, specifically with the use of the term shall in section 10 and the words that on taking the citizenship shall cease in section 11. he also submits that there is no lacuna concerning sections 10 and 11 of the 1973 Act. In consequence, dual citizenship was bad, so much so that on taking the citizenship of any other country at one and the same time as that of Sierra Leone citizenship, he shall cease forthwith by operation of law without doing anything more from being a citizen of Sierra Leone. Mr. Macaulay further submits that pursuant to section 10 and 11 of the Sierra Leone Citizenship Act number 4 of 1973 and before 26 October 2006 the first defendant ceased to be a citizen of Sierra Leone and in consequence thereof lost his citizenship of Sierra Leone. Immediately he became a citizen of the United States of America and took the oath of allegiance to the United States. Mr. Macaulay submits that the Sierra Leone Citizenship Amendment Act number 13 of 1976 is significant as it regards as regards the first defendant as it did amongst others 
we stepped to be taken including the oath of allegiance to the state of Swadion on reacquiring citizenship. The idea is that notwithstanding provisions of section 4 of the Swadion Citizenship Amendment Act number 11 of 2006, which side notes read repeat and replacement of section 9 of Act number 4 of 1973, that is the principal legislation, sought to purportedly repeal and replace section 9 of the principal legislation, which ceased to be the law by virtue of the Swadion Citizenship Act number 13 of 1976, rather than section 9 of Act number 13 of 1976. Mr. Macaulay further argues that by statutory instrument number 3 of 2007, whose sh short title reads thus, quote, the Swadion Citizenship Act 2006, date of commencement order 2007, and the exercise of the powers conferred on him, the Minister of Internal Affairs ordered that the Australian Citizenship Amendment Act 2006 shall deem to come into operation on the 26th day of October 2006. According to him, that provision is not retrospective. He argues further that the Australian Citizenship Amendment Act number 11 of 2006 has not in any way repeat sections 41, 75, and 76 of the Constitution of Swadio 1991. On the contrary, the qualifications specified in sections 41, 75, and 76 still remain the eligibility criteria to be met by any person seeking to be elected a member of parliament or president of Swadio. Notwithstanding that dual citizenship is now allowed under the said Act number 11 of 2006. He submits that there is no conflict between the two enactments as the provisions of the Constitution will always be the supreme law. In support of this proposition, he cited the dictum of Charles he from Benjamin JSC in the Ghanaian case of New Patriotic Party against Inspector General of Police 2001 Organa Law Report that the Supreme Court 1993 in the following words. Quote, where any law or action is in conflict with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, which is the fundamental law of the land, then to the extent of such conflict or inconsistency, that law is unconstitutional, void and unenforceable, unquote. Mr. McCauley profers that the Citizenship, the Citizenship Amendment Act number 11 of 2006 did not automatically reconfer citizenship with the insertion of the new section 19a on all those who had lost him by operation of law by virtue of sections 10 and 11 of act number 4 of 1973 and before the coming into effect of act number 11 of 2006 or had ceased to be citizen of Radion by any other manner as provided for under the 1973 act Counsel for the first defendant, Dr. Abdullahi Conte, in his statement of case, paragraph C, under the rubric Arguments of Submissions, submits that the plaintiff by the originating notice of motion is seeking to abuse the jurisdiction of the court in the guise of a constitutional challenge. Dr. Conte proffers that the appropriate way to approach this court in the circumstances of a case where a person seeks to object to the candidacy of a candidate for presidential election is expressly provided for by section 47 of the public elections act 2012 this should be done by way of a properly formulated objection if any to the candidacy of that candidate dr conte urges this court to decline the invitation to interpret certain provisions of the citizenship acts in particular sections 10 and 11 of act number no. 4 of 1973 he argues that the plaintiff expressly requests the court to state the effect in law before the coming to effect of Act Number 10, Act Number 11 of 2006. Such an invitation is manifestly an invitation to entertain an academic question. He submits that the relevant legal and subsisting provisions on dual nationality are clearly stated in Section 5 of Act Number 11 of 2006. He admits that dual citizenship by Sierra is now permissible 
Dr. Conte Ford uh, argues that it is not the proper role of any court to pronounce the effect of the law before coming to effect of an amending legislation. The proper role of a court when properly seized is to interpret and pronounce on the effect of subsisting legislation. The declaration sought. This court has been asked to make a declaration that by virtue of section 11 of the Israeli Citizenship Act number 4 of 1973 as amended and before the coming to effect of the Israeli Citizenship Amendment Act number 10, uh, 11 of 2006 any person upon attaining the age of 22 years being a citizen of Sierra Leone and also a citizen of another country ceases to be a citizen of Sierra Leone. The petitioner went further to seek a declaration that in the light of the declarations C to H being granted that the first defendant is disqualified for election as a member of parliament of the Republic of Sierra Leone and thereby disqualified from election as president of Sierra Leone. I will comment that the declaration sought in paragraph 4 of the plaintiff's statement of claim is purely academic and inconsistent with the interpretative powers of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is required to interpret an existing law and not the effect of a repeat provision in the statute. The plaintiff is asking us to determine the citizenship status of the first defendant between the enactment of the Federal Citizenship Act 1973 as amended and the coming to effect of Act number 11 of 2006. It is my view that this court should not and must not do so. It is a principle in constitutional interpretation that a statute after being repealed becomes effective, uh, uh, ineffective. The repealing statute abolishes a repeal statute as if it has never been made by parliament, except for saving clauses. Each and every part of the statute is considered unconstitutional. Thus, the repeal of an act of parliament cause it to cease to be part of the corpus juris or the body of law. As Benyon puts it in Benyon on statutory interpretation, fifth edition, section 85, pages 300 to 301, quote, the judicial effect of repeal and expiry are identical. In each case, the floodlight is switched off, unquote. This view has judicial support in the persuasive English case of Suretis against Edison. 1829, 9B and C, 752, where Lord Tentatin said, quote, where an act of parliament is repealed, it must be considered, except as the transactions passed and closed, as if it had never existed. Tyndall CJ states the exception more widely in K against Gobin, when he said, quote, the effect of a Repealing a statute is to obliterate it com as completely from the records of parliament as if it had never been passed. And it must be considered as a law that never existed except for the purpose of those actions that you have commenced, prosecuted, and concluded whilst it was an existing law. Let me just get a taste of water. In the instant case, section 10. 10 of number 4 of 1973 was expressly repeated and replaced by section 5 of Act number 11 of 2006. It follows that the same provision should be treated after the operative date of repeal as if it was never enacted. I will therefore reject the argument of counsel for the plaintiff that posture to sections 10 and 11 of the Citizenship Act number 4 of 1973 and before the 26th day of October. 2006, the first defendant ceased to be a citizen of Australia. Immediately, he became a citizen of the United States and took an oath of allegiance to the same United States. On the contrary, I hold that as soon as Act Number 11 of 2006 was enacted, the pre-sections of the Act Number of Act Number 4, 1973, ceased to have any legal effect. The first defendant, as a citizen by birth as opposed to a citizen by naturalization, was automatically entitled to the benefit of the amendment, save the limitations set out in sections 41, 75, and 76 of the Constitution of Sierra Leone, number 6 of 1991. 
the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue here is whether a person holding dual citizenship is qualified to be a member of parliament and thus be elected as president of the Republic of Sierra Leone. The, the issue of citizenship is not expressly provided for in the Constitution of Sierra Leone. The main reference to citizenship is to be found in Section 173, which provides that, quote, the provisions of any consequential provisions act under this constitution and any act related to citizenship shall not be amended, repealed, reenacted, or replaced unless the bill incorporated such amendments, repeal, reenactment, or replacement is supported as a final vote upon by the vote of not less than two thirds of the members of parliament. There's no evidence that the 2000 Act did not receive the necessary two thirds votes of members of parliament. And so the maxim, omnia presumito, rite est solumita, esi acta donect in contrarium applies. This means that all things are presumed to be rightly and duly performed unless the contrary is proved. The Surrender Citizenship Act No. 11 of 2006 flows from Section 173 of the Constitution of Sierra Leone as the Surrender Citizenship Act 1973 as amended. We continue to be valid law by virtue of Sections 176 and 177 of the Constitution of Sierra Leone dealing with existing law and application of existing law. It follows that the law related to citizenship in Sierra Leone is governed by the Citizenship Act. 1973 as amended, the Citizenship Amendment Act 1976 and 1977, and the Australian Citizenship Act 2006. The 2006 Act repealed and replaced key provisions in the 1973 Act, but it did not repeal and re replace any reference made to the 1976 Act. This is understandable as that relates only to citizenship by naturalization. In determining the key issue raised herein, the relevant provision is Section 5 of the Australian Citizenship Amendment Act 2006, which provides as follows, quote, Section 10 of the Principal Act is repealed and replaced by the following section. 10. A citizen of Sierra Leone may hold a citizenship of another country in addition to his citizenship of Sierra Leone, unquote. This provision needs no interpretation. The words are clear and un unambiguous and must be applied according to its terms. As the authors of Horsbury's Laws of England, Statutes, Volume 44, 1, Reissue, Paragraph 1487, put it, quote, If there is nothing to modify, alter, or qualify the language which a statute contains, the words and sentences must be construed in their ordinary and natural meaning." Unquote. Section 5 of Act Number 11 of 2006 has a straightforward and clear meaning with no contradictions. It means that contrary to Section 10 of the Citizenship Act 1973, which provides that no person shall have a Sardinian citizenship and any other citizenship at one at the same time, a Sardinia is not allowed to hold dual citizenship. Consistent with this construction, I hold that a person having Sardinia citizenship may now hold the citizenship of any other country. If that person is a citizen by birth, he shall, he or she, for political correctness, shall enjoy all the rights of a citizen without dual nationality save in specified cases provided for in the Constitution of Sierra Leone, Act No. 6 of 1991. The next question, which has attracted a lot of public interest and at times hostile debates, is whether a person holding dual citizenship by virtue of Section 5 of Act No. 11 of 2006 is qualified to be elected as a member of the President of Sierra Leone. And the answer of this question are Section 75A, Section 76-1A, and Section 41 of the Constitution of Australia, 1991, which provides as follows. Section 75A, subject to the provisions of Section 76, any person who is a citizen of Australia, otherwise that by naturalization, shall be qualified for election as a member of parliament. 76A, 
no person shall be qualified for election as a member of parliament a if he's a naturalized citizen or is a citizen of any of, of a country other than Saudi Arabia, become such a citizen voluntary rule or other a declaration of allegiance to such a country. Provides that a uh, provides that no person shall be qualified for election as president unless a he, he is a citizen of Sierra Leone, he is a member of a political party, has attained the age of 40 years is rather qualified to be a member of parliament it is not worthy that these provisions are clear they do not require the mobilization of any of the unknown, uh, other canons of constitutional interpretation to determine their meanings before giving, giving any interpretative answer to the questions envisaged or asked i shall reproduce the submissions of counsel on it i must state that both are agreed on the significant constitutional relevance of sections 41, 75, and 76 of the Constitution of Sierra Leone in determining the eligibility criteria to become a member of parliament and president. These provisions are connected to the extent that in order to be elected as president, a person must, amongst others, be qualified to be a member of parliament. In the qualifications to be a member of parliament, you must not hold dual citizenship. Counsel for the plaintiff, Senator Macaulay, made the following submission on this issue. Quote, we submit that there is no gain saying this act, so I do citizenship, I mean act number 11 of 2006, has in no way, manner, or form amended sections 41, 75, and 76 of the Constitution of Saradio. On the contrary, the qualification specified in 41, 75, and 76 still remain qualifications to be met by any person seeking to be elected to be a member of parliament and or president of the republic of Sierra Leone, notwithstanding that dual citizenship is not allowed under act number 11 of 2006 in other words although dual citizenship is not allowed by virtue of act number 11 of 2006 the qualification for seeking to be elected as a member of parliament and president are not to be found in the said act but rather expressly provided for in section 41 75 and 76 of the said constitution of the constitution and the same qualifications remain the same council for the first defendant dr abdullah conte had this to say quote it is readily co considered for the first defendant that even with the possession of dual citizenship by saradinians since 2006 the constitutional inhibitions on the eligibility of those dual citizens for the purposes of election to parliament and the presidency still remain in place therefore there's no conflict between the Sierra citizenship act 2006 and Sierra Leone's dual citizenship and the relevant provisions of the constitution limiting eligibility for the purposes of election to parliament and the presidency to only Sierra Leoneans who do not hold or possess dual citizenship Dr. Conte submits for that the temporal of focus of, in, uh, of the ineligibility criteria stated in the Constitution in sections 41, 75, and 76 is on the present and continuing holder of dual citizenship. It could be discerned from the submissions of both council that, irrespective of the provisions of the Australian citizenship amendment act number 11 of 2006 the criteria for members of parliament and president are to be found in sections 41 75 and 76 of the constitution of soradio in other words the 2006 act did not in any way supplant the said constitutional provisions if that you are the intention of parliament any such provision will have been unconstitutional the concept of citizenship is deeply rooted in the principle of allegiance. It could be traced to biblical verses, particularly Matthew 6, verse 23, where it is stated that, quote, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Unquote. As counsel for the first defendant explains, quote, in a representative democracy, it is readily submitted on behalf of the first defendant that it is important 
the holders of the highest offices in the country should not possess or have dual or split allegiance stemming from the possession of dual citizenship. The requirement extends to public offices such as the highest office in the land, the presidency, legislators, parliament, and ministers of government. There should be only one locus of allegiance when it comes to these offices. It is inimical and greatly detrimental to the public interest for any country to have its elected public officials or those holding senior government positions to have dual citizenship for the reason that they may, at such critical stage of discharging their functions, be susceptible to the temptations of split loyalty that may be involved in holding dual citizenship. Unquote. I agree entirely with Dr. Conte on this point. I will illustrate this by a scenario in which a president of Sierra Leone, I mean a president, not the president, by which a president of Sierra Leone, who is the commander in chief of the armed forces, is a Chinese Mabat, and simultaneously holds citizenship on, of another country. In the event of an armed conflict between Sierra Leone and that other country, where will his loyalty lie? If he declares war or sustains a war against the other country, it will amount to breach of allegiance to that state with all its legal implications. Conversely, if he gives any support to that country, he will be in breach of allegiance to Sierra Leone. For the reasons given herein, I hold that irrespective of the Sierra Leone Citizenship Amendment Act No. 11 of 2006, Section 41, 75, 76 are the constitutional provisions containing eligibility criteria for members of parliament and the president of the republic of Sierra Leone. that is the law as it is copying from john austin we should be thinking of the law as it ought to be for the avoidance of doubt in order to qualify to contest for the office of president or member of parliament you must amongst others be a citizen by birth and must not hold the citizenship of any other country. Having so heard, I will clarify that this constitutional limitation could be cured by invoking Section 7 of the Sierra Leone Citizenship Amendment Act No. 11 of 2006, which provides as follows. The principal act is amended by insertion immediately after Section 19 of the following new section, 19A. When a citizen of Sierra Leone, being of full age and capacity, has at any time acquired the citizenship of any foreign country, one by birth or two, any voluntary or former act, or be done any act or thing, the sole or primary purpose of which, or the effect of which was, or is to acquire the citizenship of a foreign country, and that person ceased to be a Sierra by reason thereof, he may, if he so wishes, resume his Sierra citizenship. On a true construction of this section, as long as a person renounces his citizenship of the other country before submitting himself as a candidate for parliamentary or presidential elections, he shall be qualified to do so. In other words, as soon as a person is under, is no longer under allegiance to any other country and is, of, and is a citizen by birth, not by naturalization or registration, and fulfills all the other requirements laid out in sections 41, 75, and 76 of the Constitution, he shall be qualified to be elected a member of parliament and thereby eligible for election as president of Sierra Leone. My Lord, this is my you. Yes, I may. Um, finally, my Lord, why I, ag why I agree with the declaration sought, I will add for the avoidance of doubt, we are a Sierra Leonean citizen by birth who later becomes a citizen of another country, later renounces that citizenship, he automatically resumes his Sierra Leonean citizenship. Thank you. My lord, my lady, I think you call that. My God. My God. Sorry, yes, my God, 49. Paragraph 49 and 50, I'm missing from my script, I'll supply them. Actually, they deal with the, what uh, Justice Jallo said in the Dabo case and um, uh, the beginning of my commentary on the Australian case. I think I'm, uh, I mistakenly left paragraphs 
50 and 51 out. Um, gentlemen and ladies at the bar, we are going to do the corrections. The Peter judgments will be available on Monday. So you can send your clerks to the High Court Registry. Just the latest by 11. Supreme Court Registry. By Supreme Court Registry, I beg your pardon, Supreme Court Registry. This is by 11 a.m. The printed judgments, after the corrections have been made, will be available. But it has been broadcast live, so it's easy to, um, uh, I mean, most of you know what the conclusions are. Or all of you should know what the conclusions are. Thank you very much for your cooperation. for a GC and, and they be able for represent in party but one member will contest against them. See so well and not be denounced in citizenship where it is one for the office as a president and um, parliamentarian. So that the decision the Supreme Court will look into the matter and then on today. But I got one very important personality with me. We, of course, step now the presidential applicant against the own party. Um, today, also with me, good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Claudia. Community party chair. I get two feelings. I get one side way I really sad. I get one side way I for say I gladdy. I sad because imagine three years on we they get this kind of conversation. I wonder say if after a case law we go I, I, I shock say three years on and now we they cut case like this. But on the other hand, I gladdy way I hear you some justices then get for say especially within justice talk, talk. it give me a lot of satisfaction for no say yes certain things and the way they are very wrong where you get to know what you they use the judiciary for you cannot use the judiciary for political my, uh, shenanigans as yeah. it were yeah. forget you your will so i glad it where this matter don't be put to bed at the whole state once and for all because if you were born a Sahelian, why on earth you pay for go for go to say I want for be said you cannot be stateless. So I so much appreciate the fact that as a lawyer, the fact that I hear all thing, and the fact that they don't make them quite clear now. Politics for politics, the judiciary for day for judiciary. No, no, they mix up the two. In other words, forget real separation of power. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So that was the judiciary don't prove um, the, the metal. But um, no, I appreciate yes. them. I, I really appreciate them. And I say I go particularly single out Justice Thompson. No, I don't because a woman. Well, she excelled on this on this on this situation. I mean, more than say I'm swaiti white boy. So I, I really appreciate in clarity and uh, the way we talk. Let us really understand. So even the person may not go, when the law uh, experience like uh, me, are able to understand exactly in point where they make. So this, the man, the way guy, yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dennis Bright, of course, uh, the chairman uh, of the NGC. Of course, the name be mentioned um, a few times in that particular judgment. But doctor, how do you feel? Today, the Supreme Court law laid this matter to rest. Yeah, um, I feel happy, actually because actually it didn't take so long. Yeah. It's not past three years. So uh, you can.
can imagine that uh, as chairman of the party, yeah. we, you know, we candidates now have been challenged. Um, I must feel relief that clarity don't do over this issue. You say, you say, self will not say uh, the papers them yeah. just recently been there with a lot of things that for say and they can't decide for pool. Uh, Dr. Kande Yumkela come on, in a parliament. Well, maybe they not been there in possession of some of the facts. Or something, they been in possession of the facts, but they no one to put up. That the fact is that Dr. Kande Yumkela will make a decision in the country for a uh, renounce in citizenship we get with the United States and for all, only in citizenship of Sierra Leone, we get by birth because they are born. And so we qualify for run for both as well as for it. So if we don't do that long before the nomination self. Is it that people and we don't do that but some people and decide uh, for ignore that? Is it that they decide for that or the moment like that? Well, I'm not going to talk for them people today because it's not a motivation. But the reason why we feel an our party because that particular case they be affected serious. Because people have been done decide for vote for many of them not being votes for we again because then free say then they waste their time. In fact them they give the impression they say Dr. you cannot go even there on the ballot. Okay. So it been really affects the morale of voters. Then I make we been feel like but you know they say fall right white. Right. We don't come to a situation now. We don't see. But what we're proud of now, um, now the NGC. We're proud of the fact that around we now issue uh, they benefit all citizens. Now even we they try for put across. This issue here so we've been done the push them even right now we're not in government safe. We did try to draw attention to the plight of people them we get to do our citizenship. That then self, especially the way we born in this country, then self na people them we get certain rights. Let we begin to think about them. So man they under the economy of this country, a lot of them they contribute significantly to the economy in this country. Then they bail out farming we day in distress, especially with the problems them now this uh, Sierra Leone. So all the reasons then they for make we begin look at their brother and sisters then they when some of them not to say anything we all understand why then did they then go get this uh, citizenship. So all the issues then they now we don't bring up but we're glad anyway with this done done this this way we don't so yeah thank you very much this right thank you very thank much, you much. I appreciate you all right, okay, come in at the chairman for the NGC. I'll talk to the uh, communications director of um, the judiciary. They are with me, El Cas um, Sardo. El Cas. Now, um, of course, this long awaited uh, Supreme Court's decision on this matter of or citizenship, you know, especially. Uh, with the um, Dr. Kane Kela of the NGC and one of the other, somebody we stand as a plaintiff. Uh, now, tell Formule well, in, in that simple term that um, the decision we have been now uh, this court today, what do you mean? Um, Formule M, we the listen or the watch the program. I want me to now understand today. today the Supreme Court judges uh, were presided over by the Acting Chief Justice, Honorable Justice Brown Mark, then deliver a landmark judgment today. The matter actually starts in a high court. 
um, the plaintiff will mean the person will complain the NGC, the presidential candidate, will now in the parliament, Al Haji, Dr. Kande Kole Yomkela, na David Fona. He come before the High Court. And in opinion, he say the NGC presidential candidate not qualify for be presidential candidates at that time for the election for, for contest the 2018 um, presidential elections. A good reason why, in, in opinion, a feel say a not qualify. Among the reasons them we give now that uh, a dual citizen we may say a whole two citizens. citizen and a, in one um, in a salon citizen then the whole American citizenship. Now, when it came before the High Court, um, according to Kande Yom Kela, then Yon, then say, they not full say this, the High Court gets power for Sidon on that matter. Day. So they run can Supreme Court because to them, they believe say, when it comes to presidential issues, now only the Supreme Court get that power for able to decide on that. So today, if they are today where they don't on that matter, because that man, David Fona, complained, he says, um, Honorable Kande Yom Kela, not qualified for be a um, presidential candidate at that time. And the constitution also, very, very clear, very clear, um, the 1991 constitution, say if you for qualify for become a presidential candidate if you also qualify for become member of parliament but i don't really want to go into the interpretation because the supreme court judges them today they don't actually interpret the law for we they make reference to uh, the citizenship 1973 even the amended one 2006 even the the constitution of office they make reference judgment today not affect the um, candidature or not affect um, okay. Kande, Dr. Yom Kela for loss in seat as member of parliament uh, we parliament today. Thank you very much. Uh, at least you don't explain that people are not able to understand and because it's a landmark decision by the Supreme Court judges. Yes, but I, I want also to conclude on this. Um, if family and way they listen or where they watch the program, they notice say uh, um, almost all the judges them get for read their own judgment. They, they waiting them believe on that them the particular matter. It show the independence of we judges them. It show say some this judge say yes, I agree. Say they for this the, they for this the the complainant forget cost. Or I agree, say the procedure where they come before the courts not correct. This person here say no, me not agree with this. Me, in my opinion, at this, that show the independence of the of the judge system, especially when we throw the make sure say the judiciary for the absolute independence. Now that we demonstrate here today to own our listen, or maybe in the watch SLBC or the whatever the station we be listening to. That now the independence of the judge them for decide say me I ag agree with you or I not agree with you. That's not the beauty of the law. Thank you very much, Mr. Cass. Thank you very much. Thank well, Fumblem of today from the director of communications with judiciary, and uh, I just want to say only one of them we of course be in the field say. Against Dr. Kande Yumkela, we the leader of the NGC. No, it not be so because even we all the judges them. Um, of course, you get Justice Brown Mark as the the president, Brian at the head. You get Justice um, um, Roberts. You get Justice uh, Thompson. Justice Alusan said uh, Justice Sengu. All sit down on this matter. Even we each of them give their own uh, views about the matter or give their own judgment about the matter but at the end of the day Dr. Kim Kela is still the leader of MGC and is still there in the parliament they're not able for on CITAM because the plaintiff forgets certain um, area in the constitution where you not look 
we bring the matter down na the Supreme Court. Well, I hope say una enjoy the program from the Salon Broadcasting Corporation because we always bring live um, court uh, proceedings. We don't begin the bring and can to una now. So there are matters coming up, we'll go always broadcast live. I foresee plenty of thank you. Of course, I get James Coker, the on camera, I get David Williams and my technical man um, Alexis C. Thanks to my colleagues in uh, New Englandville, Lester Peak, and the management and staff. I mean that must see the wish you a pleasant Friday and we'll hand over back to New Englandville for continuing the day's broadcast.